I'd like to talk about uh, optimizing treatment of high-grade CIN. And I'd like to say, first of all, that uh, it's, it's wonderful to behold the uh, success of the UK National Health Service Cervical Screening Program. 400,000 significant abnormalities have been detected in the last 20 years, representing a conservative estimate of 4,500 lives saved and 75% of cervical cancer being prevented. But of course, it's not the screening that uh, saves lives. Rather, it's the management of screen positive women that actually saves lives. I think as cytology and histopathology move to more objective and less subjective uh, assessment of abnormality, so-colposcopy is perhaps trailing behind and it's quite difficult to make colposcopy completely objective. But things like the Strander score, the Swede score, or Bjorn Strander Swede score, will perhaps make it more objective. And I think that if your colposcopy practice happens in the context of a rigorous training program and a rigorous quality assured colposcopy service, then you will not get the negative uh, the high uh, uh, false negative rates that you've heard from the ALT study and from other studies uh, recently published. And there are two very large studies in the UK that have looked at about nearly a thousand women each who have low grade abnormality suspected cytologically, in whom a negative colposcopy without biopsy has extremely high negative predictive value. And the difference uh, between the UK studies and the ALT studies are that the CIN23 was discovered at the first colposcopic examination rather than subsequently from random biopsy. And I would argue that that is because the UK colposcopy training program is rigorous, the quality assurance program is rigorous, colposcopy is only performed by uh, devoted colposcopists and it works, and we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. So we don't believe in the UK in multiple random biopsies. Treatment may be excisional or, or uh, destructive. I believe destructive therapy has serious limitations, though I think cold coagulation may well come back to be a useful entity, uh, particularly in the developing world. Indications for treatment are, as ever, a balance of risks, and I, I warmly, uh, warmly uh, welcome the suggestion that we should try and stratify risk and, and uh, refer people and treat people according to similar risks. And I really think that that's a, a wonderful development uh, that we should embrace. We treat virtually all high-grade disease, most CIN2, but often not CIN2 in young women. We treat high-risk patients with persistent low-grade disease. And we treat, by and large, by excision. And in the same way that Colposcopy is not a single entity. Colposcopy practiced by somebody who does a lot of colposcopy, who's properly trained, who works in a quality assured program. It's completely different to colposcopy that's performed by somebody who has not been properly trained, sees very little CIN3. And so let's, or LEAP, as it uh, became translated when it, it arrived in the US, let's, or LEAP, uh, are not a single entity. An excision of a small ectocervical TZ is a simple, safe, highly effective method of treatment associated with minimal complications, both short and long term and pregnancy related. But the excision of a large or endocervical TZ is a completely different kettle of fish. In terms of principles of treatment, you should treat the entire TZ, excise only the, uh, the TZ, and minimize artifactual damage. I make a plea for somebody to start doing some research on wound management. Because whatever damage we do to the cervix morphologically by way of excision, anybody who has witnessed uh, management of the wound will tell you that one person's light painting of electrosurgical diathermy across a wound is completely different to another's uh, where excessive diathermy may be applied and inevitably morphological damage. 
I think we should always treat under binocular vision, always try and ensure full vision of the entire TZ, uh, and pr try and practice a fulgurative technique rather than a, a uh, desiccative one. Very briefly, this is well established in IFCPC nomenclature. Type 1 TZs are uh, ectocervical, type 2s may be endocervical, but fully visible, and type 3s are uh, endocervical and not fully visible. And I'm, I'm laboring this point because I think treatment uh, is, a, is a, an entity that encompasses a mul multiplicity of sins, and that the excision of the type 3 TZ is something that is associated with genuine risk of both failure uh, and complication, and a type 1 is not. And one of the things that the new IFCPC uh, classification does is introduce the concept of a type 1, type 2, and type 3 excision, so that terms like conization and cone biopsy are abandoned. Because if you look in the literature, cone biopsy in many UK, Australian, and Canadian publications means excision of the endocervical transformation zone of 15 to, to 30 millimeters. Whereas conization in many US uh, and European uh, publications can mean excision of any TZ, ectocervical or otherwise. So it's a term that means something completely different to different people. And I would argue that uh, in the same way that I hope this video is going to come on. I may have to go back to it. Let's do it this way. And I simply want to show you a simple excision of a very simple. Can you see that? You can't really see that, can you? Can I bring it up now, do you think? No. No. Yeah, it's doing it. OK. OK, it's doing it. But excision of a simple, small ectocervical TZ uh, is completely different to that of a type 3 excision. And this procedure, done under local anesthetic in the outpatient, at the person's first visit, because she'd a high-grade smear and colposcopy agreed, the point, what the point of doing a biopsy is on this woman, I simply don't understand. Uh, she needs treatment at her first visit, she goes home and she's finished with it. And that's a very simple procedure uh, and one that would not uh, cause a problem to, to any colposcopist. However, a type 3 excision, in other words, the excision of a TZ that's uh, uh, endocervical and not fully visible, or where you suspect microinvasive disease or glandular disease, or perhaps where she's had previous treatment and colposcopy just isn't good enough to determine the precise limits of the TZ. When you, whether you use a long, uh, large loop or whether you use a straight wire is personal preference, and, and uh, I, I don't have a view about which is better at this time. But this woman who had a high-grade uh, squamous lesion and who had fortunately finished her family uh, had a type 3 TZ where the TZ was not fully visible in the endocervical canal. And with the use of endocervical forceps, even though you could look 10, 15 millimeters up the canal, you still couldn't see it. This procedure, as many of you will appreciate, has a completely different uh, performance to that of a simple type 1 excision. And this is both more difficult to do, will more often need to be done under general anesthesia, has a higher complication rate, both short term and pregnancy related. And I'm not going to play it forever because it takes, uh, even in my hands, it took, uh, <laughs> took a few minutes. So we'll not, not delay with that. Uh, just to move on to... Uh, follow-up post-treatment to say the risk of invasive disease now appears to last for a very long time and that risk may be four or five times the general populations and therefore they certainly need continuing monitoring for 20 years hopefully with HPV uh, stroke cytology combinations. Uh, I'd like to spend the last five minutes talking about three aspects of excision that I think inform both the colposcopist and the patients in terms of prediction of success and morbidity. The first one is we know margin status is an important uh, predictor of risk. Uh, if you have clear margins, it doesn't mean you ha that you don't have residual disease, but the chance is very much less. Uh, in Gay Magami's meta-analysis, the risk was 3% uh, for complete excision and 18 for incomplete. We looked at the relationship between the type of excision, whether it's type 1, 2, or 3, and, and negative margins. And we all don't want to inflict, none of us want to inflict morphological damage upon the cervix. So when we're faced with a large TZ, a type 2 or type 3 large TZ, 
we perhaps don't remove as much tissue as we used to. And we found, looking at our own uh, patient population, a, a, th a thousand women who had uh, excision over a four-year period, that the large type 2 and the large type 3 TZ had a two- or three-fold increased risk of there being incomplete excision. So that we tried not to, to uh, remove unnecessary amounts of epithelium, and in so doing, we risked leaving a higher proportion of women with incomplete excision. And I think that's an, an important message. Uh, so when you come across a woman who's got a large TZ, if it's type 2 or type 3, you need to say to yourself, I need to do a larger excision here. I need to counsel the patient appropriately about the relatively increased risk of premature labor. Accept that, uh, but rather don't uh, uh, produce incomplete excisions, because when you have to do two excisions, the risk of subsequent pregnancy-related complications is four times greater than that of a single excision. Complications after letter are low. We know that. We also know that there are pregnancy-related complications. And uh, Mark Hirschu and subsequently Mark Arben's meta-analysis uh, confirmed that, 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 that excisions are associated with increased risk of premature labor. Fortunately, LETS or LEAP does not appear to be associated with increased risk of severe pregnancy-related complications. And morphological damage after excision is entirely biologically plausible, is it not? Perhaps it's related to the amount. I think it almost certainly is. In the original publication by Mark Kirju, it appeared that in the few papers who published the length of excision, that there wasn't an increased risk of prem labor in those women in whom the excision was less than 10 millimeters long, in other words, up the canal. We looked at our patients, 353 women who had had a LETS and subsequently conceived over a four-year period. And we found that there was an increased risk of preterm labor, a threefold increased risk of preterm labor, if the specimens were larger than six cubic centimeters. And that was a very simple calculation of length by thickness by a per perimeter. And it's not an exact measurement, but it was standard. We also found that if in the open specimen, and we open all our specimens before pinning them, if the thickness of the excised epithelium was greater than 12 millimeters, it was also a threefold increase in the risk of premature labor subsequently. In summary, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we should define our treatment threshold in the same way as previous speakers have talked about defining risk of progression to, uh, or, or risk of having CIN3. We should always treat under colposcopic vision. We should excise the entire TZ, and I believe it should be in one piece. We should try to minimize the excision of normal tissue but let's not miss, uh, let's not incompletely excise the TZ. And someday, somebody's going to do some work on wound management, uh, which uh, so far is a real gap in the literature. Uh, I thank you for your attention.